Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today on the show, this is what it sounds like when your toaster writes a divorce book. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Seth Nelson. I'm here, as always, with my good friend, Pete Wright. If your divorce turned you into your own private detective as you peeled your marriage into pieces, our guest this week is your spirit animal. Gabriella Stone is an actor, podcaster, and writer. She wrote the book, Eat, Pray, Hashtag, Fuck My Life, which was released in 2017 and the upcoming sequel due to drop in just a few weeks. Gabrielle, welcome to The Toaster. I love that intro, guys. I think that's one of the better ones I've had. So thank you. I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) You're very kind. All right. Well, if you're happy, (laughs) thanks for coming. This was (laughs) a great show. Before we disappoint you. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Okay. Um, I, I, I don't even know (laughs) where to start with this book. It is I love it. amazing. I need to talk. Yeah. Okay, B, I know where to start with yeah. this book. I know exactly where to start, yeah. okay? Because her marriage was two years, right, Gabrielle? Yeah, two we year were marriage com- to start with. Coming up on two years, yeah. <sighs> right. So, as Pete, as you know, I was married for three yeah. years, which my girlfriend says, that's not a marriage. That's a long <laughs> weekend. <laughs> so... I think two years might be like a one night stand. Right. I don't really know how we're going to lay that out. I would consider it that as well. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I- I'm telling you, if at some point we don't get uh, updates on all of these people in this show, we're doing it wrong. But I just, I, I need to start. There are things that I am curious about. Uh, okay. and-, and I'm hoping you can give our listeners, for those who I don't know how any of our listeners wouldn't have stumbled across this book because amazing, um, that uh, we could start a little bit about when you turned into the private investigator, right? Because we all, we hear these stories, like you get these stories where there's infidelity involved and one partner feels like there are these clues and things are starting to come apart, but they're they're being gaslit and they don't know how to turn from like, oh my gosh, I'm being lied to, I need to solve this, right? I need to get mm-hmm. to the bottom of it. And you did that. And I I'm very curious if you could get us up to speed on that process so our listeners all know where we're going and then we'll talk a little bit about the legal side of it because i'm real curious about that too yeah totally so it's interesting because when i was in my marriage i didn't know about narcissists and gaslighting and we talk so much about that on my podcast fml talk now but i had no idea that i was married to a narcissist or being gaslit and i trusted him so completely and so blindly that I never even had an inkling to look through his phone. There was never that type of energy between us. None of my friends saw this coming. None of my family, my mother, who's like got intuition like a psycho, his parents, like nobody saw this coming from him, that he was not that guy. And it happened really circumstantially. I didn't even go looking or digging for stuff. You know, there had been some red flags that had presented themselves, which are all in the book. And he had gone out of town on a work trip. I was in our office and getting something out of the filing cabinet and his big iMac was there and I heard an email ding go off and I ignored it at first. And then two more dings came in. So I went to go look at it and it was an Uber receipt from him Ubering from where he was supposed to be in Florida to Miami. And I was like, "Mm, why are you going to Miami? That's not, mm -mm." Uh, and that was all it took. I looked in the trash email and found all of the receipts from six months of an affair. Mm. And it was just like evidence beyond evidence. And I was just like blown away. Um, And when I found that, I was already, because of the problems we had been having and the red flags that had come up. Yeah, it's like the relationship was not great, right? No, 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 not at all. Um, We had been really unhappy in in therapy for six months. I was working my ass off. He was doing nothing, but I didn't realize why. And I was already 95% sure I was going to get divorced, Mm -hmm. but it was that last 5% that just like, I was like, God, should I stay? And like keep going to therapy and work on my marriage. I made this commitment. We took vows. 
And then I found all of that and that blew that fucking 5% yeah. wide open. Yeah. And that's interesting you say that because Pete, we've talked about it before. It's usually a longer journey to find yourself saying, I'm ready for a divorce. Now, when something major like this happens, it accelerates oh, it. Yeah. But sometimes that last 5% is really hard to get over to pick up the phone and call the divorce attorney or to tell your friends, I'm out. Yeah. Uh, you know, and a lot of that I think is being courageous of yourself. Be it takes a lot of confidence to say that. And people don't realize it at the time that I think it is at some levels can be the most important decision and strongest decision you can make for yourself. And I'm not trying to encourage people to get divorced here. I'm just saying, if you're in that situation, you need to protect yourself on who you are as a person. I'm not saying from a legal perspective or any of that matter, who are you? And are you going to allow yourself to be treated like this? And if so, what is that saying about you? And do you want to change that? Absolutely. And I know people that have gone through infidelity and have gone to counseling and worked through it and ended up with a stronger marriage. I am not that person. <laughs> I I don't, you know, put up or tolerate with being disrespected in that way. And there was never a question in my mind. I mean, I was on the phone with a divorce attorney later that day. Um and it it really in hindsight I was grateful to him. And I am grateful to him because it made it so easy for me to just be like, okay, I'm done and walk away instead of staying in a miserable marriage for another two, three, four years, trying to make it work when it was never going to. Well, yeah. And I, I kept found myself asking every page turn. I'm like, how many times did you ask yourself, why am I working at all to stay in love with an idiot? Like somebody who is right, so disrespectful right. <laughs> of the of the marriage. Okay, now, Pete. Yeah. Pete, yeah. Hold on. Hold on. Like you've just given the line for ninety eight percent of the women <laughs> to get divorced. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. <laughs> well, I think to be fair, I think that a lot of the times when you're in those toxic dynamics, you don't see things as clearly as you do when you take those, you know, love goggles off. Um, or the toxic goggles off, whatever you might mm -hmm. be in. And when you step back from an outside perspective, you're like, oh my God, this was fucking doomed from the start. Yeah. But when you're in it, you know, you don't see it as clearly. And especially with my ex-husband, he wasn't an asshole. He wasn't this like terrible person 90% of the time. There was, of course, a 10% where I look back and I'm like, oh, dude, he was gaslighting me. He was making me feel like shit for wanting to have a career, mm -hmm. a bunch of horrible things. But he did it in a way that didn't make it seem all that bad when I was in it. So I was trying to wrestle with, do I stay and fight for this marriage when he hasn't done anything that bad? before I had found out about the cheating. it's a, That's the Maya Angelou thing, right? Bo blow, bite, and blow. You blow a little bit on the skin, then you bite when you can't feel it, and then you blow to make it... You never know you've been bitten, but totally. you're totally being eaten alive. Uh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, okay, you, the... The piece that I'm curious about is you're starting to do this investigative stuff, right? You find all the receipts, you find... You didn't mention second phones, Good grief. Uh, who does he think yeah. he is at this point? But uh, so there's a lot that's unraveling the phone in the underwear drawer, all that stuff. Uh, but then it gets to to you're talking to the attorney and you don't really talk about this in the book. And I'm curious why or why not when you do the process serving, right, when you schedule the time and he comes over and you serve him the papers, the way you talk about that experience implies that there was some level of hesitance, that there was risk involved in, in that approach. You, you ask him to keep the door open. You tell him that there are people who are expecting a call from you. It feels mm -hmm. very much like you're setting up for a guy who is potentially violent. And we hadn't really gotten that perspective so far. What is it go that, that's going through your head as you're approaching the moment of recognition or, or, you know, that, that both of you are parting ways. Yeah, I, it was so nerve wracking. Um, I've never experienced anxiety quite like that. And it had been building over two weeks of me gathering all this evidence and information and meeting with the lawyers. And it was 
really debilitating anxiety. And the day that I knew he was coming to the house for the process server to serve the papers, there were so many variables involved. It was like, is he going to come early? Is the process server going to be here on time? Is he going to be able to like get everything done the way it's supposed to get done? It was very like throwing chips in the air and hoping they fall Mm -hmm. the right way. And when he got there and I told him that he could come inside if he wanted to talk about everything, with me saying, leave the door open and there are people that know that I'm here and are expecting me to call when I leave. I didn't know this person anymore. The person that I married was not who I was living with. I mean, he had had, like you said, a second phone, which I talk about in the book. Um, He had had things booked under a totally different name. He had had multiple relations with other women. And I had no idea who this was. Mm -hmm. Like if he was capable of that, what else is he capable of? I didn't know who he was. And it was really like I was sitting down to have a conversation with a sociopath. So yeah, I was going to leave the door open. And yeah, I was damn sure going to tell him that people are expecting my call when I leave just to protect myself because I had no idea what else he had been doing. Um, And it was it was scary for me. And it's weird to think that it's that scary for you to sit down with your husband to have a discussion. Yeah. Well, this is th- that's why I want to get to that because you've now the 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 jig is up and you've talked to your attorneys and I'm curious like from your perspective Seth, how do you counsel your clients in this position? Service of process. So let's just be clear on what this is. This is like what you see in the movies when someone comes and hands them the paper and says you've yeah. been served. It was literally okay. like out of a movie. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I, I love that bit. What's your name? Who are you? What's your number? Uh, doesn't matter, bro. <laughs> yeah. And that's exactly how it went. It was ridiculous. <laughs> so I really work hard um, and I've made my mistakes as an attorney on this that I felt horrible, horrible about um, on process serving. So we take it very seriously. So one, the... If I'm representing the wife, for example, the wife doesn't have to be there when the husband gets served. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's that protection. And if there are no kids involved and we are dealing with a sociopath, then I might say, hey, go get a different place to live. And people say, well, am I abandoning the house? Does that mean I don't have rights to the house? No, that's not what it means. You know this, Pete, check your local jurisdiction. But no, you're protecting yourself. You're allowed to leave Mm -hmm. the house. The other thing that is vitally important is if you have children, we work really hard not to serve the parent with divorce papers when that parent has the children, because you never know what's going to happen then. And that just does not play well. Fast forward in court to say, yeah, you're you're so concerned about our children that you had me served when I was showing up at the parent teacher conference. Right. Right. I I mean, something is that ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so, and there's a lot of people that will try to avoid service that will dodge it. They, they have, they'll, they'll get kind of win that, Hey, she's going to file for divorce. They start checking the court file and they see that it's been filed. So they know someone's out looking for them. Um, there's lots of things that people do to try to avoid it, but you have to be careful when you're dealing with the sociopath. The flip side of that is if you already know they're talking to a lawyer, I just call the lawyer and say, hey, will you accept service on behalf of your client? They say, yes, they file one piece of paperwork in the court file. It takes them 10 minutes and we're done. Yeah. So we were really lucky because we didn't have kids together and the house that we were in, we were renting. So none of those questions really came up and I knew I was leaving that house. And we, he, I had been going through the process with my attorney for about two weeks while he was on this business trip. And I didn't want him to catch wind of any of it to then be able to file and return or whatever. So I was really quiet. Only my mother and my really close circle of friends knew about what was going on. Um, and that was part of the anxiety. Like I, I couldn't talk about it. Um, we weren't communicating a whole lot while he was on this trip because before he left, we had had a big fight and I told him I needed space, but I would still send texts that made it seem like everything was, you know, kind of okay. So he had no idea when he showed up at the house that I was going to be serving him papers. I think he knew that we were going to have a conversation and he probably was going to end it on some level. Like he had just been on 
a full blown vacation with this girl and flaunted him around all these people that we knew, but he didn't know that a divorce was going to be handed to him when he got there. I just can't even with this story. <laughs> I just can't. And it's only the beginning. I know. Oh my god. <laughs> I know. But like, Pete, we're like we're like 10 minutes into this <laughs> podcast and we're at service of process which actually isn't even the right. story. You know, I I originally wasn't even going to go into the details about the divorce. I was just going to say I got cheated on, I got divorced. And then all this stuff yeah, happened. But right. my girlfriend was like, no, Gabrielle, you have to go into detail about how you found out. That's like an episode of CSI. And so many readers are like, oh my God, I've been through that. So many things that you touch on in your book touch readers at all different levels. So let's talk about what really happened in your life. Because that is, to me, the most vulnerable, raw, honest book about divorce and finding yourself that I've read in a long time. So, and I know that's how people are connecting with you as well. Thank you. That's really so cool to hear. Not, no offense that you guys aren't my target demographic. Um, And it's so awesome. (laughs) Short Jewish bald lawyer. Wait a minute. Short Jewish bald lawyer is not your target audience here? I I love it. Um, No, but seriously, it's great when I do interviews like these and you know, men sit down to read the book because it's not something that you would pick up just by seeing it. But I did, you know, take a lot of care in the fact that heartbreak and grief is universal. It's not a female male thing. And I have a lot of male readers that do get sucked in one way or another. And I absolutely love that. So I'm, I'm interested, Seth, for to hear what you found as somebody who's both a divorce attorney and somebody who's been divorced. You know, for me, I'm I'm into the CSI stuff. Uh, what is it that really struck you and connected for you in the book? The raw emotion and honesty. Yeah. When you are open, honest, and vulnerable, that is the most powerful thing you can do for yourself. Because you're saying, here it all is, and I'm still okay. Yeah. And I'm still going to live my life, and I'm going to live my better life. And then taking that and putting it out there in the world to help others, to me, is just remarkable. and. So on every kind of step of the way, on whatever emotion it was, on whatever, when you were writing the book as you were on your travels, as you fell into this amazing romantic relationship and was going to take this trip in 48 hours prior, it's like, "Mm, nope, he doesn't want to go with you. And how that led to your journey, every step along the way is what I felt was just you being open, honest, vulnerable to help. One, your journey, you learning to be alone, you learning to love yourself, and then giving that to the world. 100%. Hit the nail on the head. What is it, what <laughs> is it that helped that, that pushed you around? Because, I, you know, for a lot of people, they live through these traumatic experiences, these relationship experiences, and they're, they just, you know, they're things that they deal with with their therapist. There's something for you that, that flipped the switch that said, you know what, this is, I I need my life to serve as a warning for others. I'm going to write this uh, first, clearly, and you talk a little bit about this, the book is an act of catharsis. Um, But, but two, what is it that makes you, that, that drives you to be of service in this way? Well, let me catch everybody up to the point where I decided I was going to write the book because it'll, it'll lead into that pretty naturally. So when I drove away from the house that I shared with my ex-husband, uh, it was about two weeks later, which you know was about a month after I had found out about the cheating after six months of being very miserable. But yes, this did happen very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, I met a guy and we fell madly in love with each other, like head over heels over the span of five days. And it was like zero to 100, meet my family. I'm going to have babies with this person. Like we're signed, sealed, delivered. And in those five days, he invited me on a month long trip to Italy with him that he had booked. And of course, at first I thought he was absolutely crazy. And then I asked him when he was leaving and he says, September 4th, 
which would have been my two-year wedding anniversary. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, when are you coming home? And he goes, October 4th, which is my late father's birthday. So at this point, I'm like, okay, universe, I hear you. Um, I'm going on the trip. So I booked my ticket and we're together for a month and a half and everything's amazing. I meet his family, fall in love with his mother. Just, we were like, oh, this is it. This is done. Um, And this is why the divorce had to happen. It all happens for a reason. And then 48 hours before we were getting on the plane, he tells me he needs to go by himself and breaks up with me. I was absolutely devastated. He broke my heart like my ex-husband never could have done. And sitting on my bed, wallowing in my tears, probably with wine, I had a decision to make. And that was either stay at home heartbroken or go travel Europe for a month by myself. And I was like, there's no question in my mind. I'm going to take this trip and I'm going to go learn how to heal myself. Um, So to answer your question, the day I found out I was going by myself, um, the following day we had a conversation and I told him, his name is Javier in the book, I was telling him I'm going to go too. And when he dropped me off from that conversation back at my mom's house, because I was divorced and living at my mom's house at the time, um, I... I remember him looking at me and saying, how are you feeling, Gabs? And I said, like I'm about to go on a journey of eat, pray, fuck my life. And that's the title. I had never, I had never, look, full transparency. I had never read Eat, Pray, Love. I went inside that night and watched the movie and sat there with my jaw open going, holy shit, this is literally my life right now. (laughs) And the next day I bought a leather bound journal and took it with me to Europe. I started it the first day I was in London and I wrote three fourths of the book on my Europe trip in the journal, not journaling and then turning it into a book when I came home. If you open the journal, it's chapter one and it's very close to how the published version ended up being. Was it like a switch for you? What? Like literally, was it like a light switch that went on and said, I have a month blocked off of my life. I got a divorce. From a sociopath. Thank God that's over. But hey, you know, I'm missing some signals here. I'm madly in love with the guy. And and you had you had dated him casually before. Very cat like gone on two dates, like six right. years earlier. Right. Yeah, very casually. And so, but you you kind of get reacquainted, you know. I think it was like Instagram or something where everyone remeets, right? Yep. Like I always call them Facebook divorces. Like, <laughs> oh, I got in touch on someone with Facebook, you know. <laughs> here, here we go, back in high school. I love it. Right. Um, so like you're questioning yourself, like, how how do I keep picking these guys? Or am I getting it? So, like, is it just a switch that you're like, I'm going to go figure this out and I've got a month in Europe and that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. It wasn't picking the guys um, that made it seem like that. Like, to be honest, I mean, and you guys read in the book, I take responsibility for the things that I need to fix and heal within myself. But I still, through all of that, will not say, oh, I blatantly ignored a bunch of red flags with both of these men because I was with my ex-husband for five years. No one saw this coming. Were there signs of manipulation and unhealthy tendencies throughout the relationship? Yes. Were there signs that he was going to slip and have his penis fall into the vagina of a 19-year-old? Not so much. Um, So, And, you know, with Javier, when he and I reconnected, he he had told me about um, that he had lost his brother two years uh, or a year and a half prior Mm -hmm. to suicide and that he had struggled with it, of course, like anyone would, um, but that he felt like he had really moved through it finally and was getting his footing and was very happy now that he was back from shooting a show and that his life was back on track. So he didn't show me any crazy red flags right up front either. Um, Now that I know about the term love bombing and what that really entails, um, I now see very clearly that that's what was happening. And he had a void within himself that he was trying to fill up with love for me. Wait, 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 wait. Um, I need I need a, a flag on the field. Can you tell me what love bombing is? I've never, yes. swear to God, never heard of that. Oh, here we go. Yes. So love bombing is when a person very quickly 
starts to shower you with love and attention and the relationship just escalates like very, very quickly. Um, there's, I love you's come very early. You're together all the time. And it's because the person normally has some type of void within themselves and wants to fill that up to feel better. So when they start having feelings for someone, they're like, oh, this is the person that can that can do that for me. They can fix me. They can make me feel better. And sometimes it's conscious. Sometimes I'm sure it's subconscious. And you know, they're, they start throwing themselves and you become their world. And it's like very intense, very fast. And then when they finally realize, oh, this isn't going to make that spot in me feel better, then they retreat and pull away. And it's usually at the height of the honeymoon stage. So when you get broken up with by a love bomber situation, it's way worse than when a relationship has yeah. run its course and it's a shitty breakup. Because you're at the height like, of your emotional the experience. Height, yeah. And it's devastating. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't say that I blatantly ignored any of these red flags. But to answer your question, when I found out I was going on this trip by myself, as devastated and heartbroken as I was, I'm a big believer in everything happens for a reason. Sometimes you can't see it until you're farther away and have some perspective. But even in that moment, I knew why it was happening. I have had a massive fear of abandonment since I was a little girl. I walked in, found my father dead on the floor when I was six years old, lost my high school sweetheart to a car accident when I was six, uh, 18. And since then, it's when I love people, they die, fear of abandonment. And the way that fear of abandonment manifested in me throughout my years was always having friends over, living with roommates, always having a man in my life, never truly being alone. And this was the universe's clear way of being like, okay, Gabrielle, we're going to go face that shit head on across the world by yourself mm -hmm. and you're going to heal it. Um, because I knew that that was the core of my being. And if I wanted to figure out how to love myself, I had to figure out how to let go of this fear of abandonment. So it was like a light switch. And my life had become this weird, fucked up sitcom with a dash of horror movies in it. <laughs> and I was like, I have to write about this. Like, you literally can't write this shit that's going on in my life right now. And I knew that whatever this Europe trip was going to bring was going to be a really big healing experience for me. You went on a trip and you describe it as, I'm going on this trip alone, but you're not really alone. You meet people from all over the world. Yep. You connect with people from all over the world. You still have your support group back home, but it still is this massive shift in your life that. I'm not going on a trip with my girlfriends. I'm not just getting on a plane flying alone to go meet my friends where you always plan out everything, mm -hmm. right? Um, so just that experience, it sounded to me through the book is that it opened yourself up and gave you a safe space. Like I can go out into the world by myself and I'm going to be who I am. There's no time for the bullshit stories that we tell ourselves and tell others when you're on this trip, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's where you find yourself. 100%. And, you know, you go and you solo travel, which I've done a second solo trip now, and I, I recommend it to everyone. It's life-changing because you realize how freaking capable you are, <laughs> that you can go out across the world in this new place totally by yourself and be completely okay. And that for me was life-changing. It was so empowering. It gave me a chance to really reflect and be with myself and meet these amazing people from all over the world and create these beautiful friendships that escalate so much quicker because when you're solo traveling, you don't have time or care to put that bullshit layer of you know, what society expects you to do when you meet someone new. And it's you're so raw and you're so authentic and it just really validates you as a human at your core. And for me, it completely changed the way I looked at the world and at myself. I, I was thinking about that as, you know, I'm, I'm reading the, at least in the first part of the book, and I'm going through the experience and I, you know, I'm, I'm a dude and I'm in a marriage. And so I'm trying to find, trying to find. You make it sound so <laughs> little. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Uh, but, but you know, I'm trying to find that empathetic vibe. Like, I'm trying to find out, like, where where did it go wrong at the beginning of that six months? And I can 
honestly kind of get there with your former spouse. Like I can, I can see how, you know, at one point this one decision was bad and then he begins lying to himself and those lies to himself, they, they grow and grow and suddenly it's an avalanche of lies and fear and, uh, and obviously now you're in it and the relationship is falling apart and it's just, it, it's just terrible. And it sounds to me like the I, again trying to put myself now in your shoes the gift he never got was learning how to stop lying to yourself about how capable you are and that is absolutely what i get that oh damn she totally figured out how to stop lying to herself like this yeah, is amazing 100% and if you only knew the trajectory that that man went on after all of this happened um I dodged a a massive, yeah. but not even a bullet, a fucking bomb. Yeah. I dodged a bomb. <laughs> I don't know how. I don't know how. There's more. I, like I hear that this there is another book coming, and I'm both exhilarated because I'm on a like 48 hour bender of just finishing your book, and <laughs> that there's a sequel is like damn straight. I'm going to read that book, but I also feel kind of sorry for you. Like, at what point are you done with a roller coaster? <laughs> You know, I'm hoping after this this sequel that that I don't have to write anymore um, in that yeah. way or capacity. Um, but you know, you never say never because look at my life. Um, but yes, so I've been getting, and I say this lovingly, hounded by my readers mm -hmm. from the first week that this book came out, um, which was a little over two years ago now. I think it actually released and was published in 2019, mm. and it hounded by my readers to release a second book and what happened after Europe. And, you know, they want to know everything that happened and ensued with Javier and do we still talk and did Chris ever come to LA and, you know, all the, all the things. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wrote it wow. and it's, it's, ju it's just as wild um, as the first one in a lot of ways. And for me, the second one was a lot more difficult to write. The first one I wrote in three months, the majority I did on the trip, um, and it just kind of flowed out of me. This one spans over a longer period of time. Uh, if you can believe it, Eat, Pray, FML is three and a half months of my life from finding out about the affair, falling in love, getting heartbroken, and going to Europe. Three and a half months. In writing it. In writing it in real time for most yeah, of it. Yeah. Yeah. Writing. I mean, that that book was written, you know, on the streets of Paris and in Airbnbs in Amsterdam and in cafes in Barcelona. By the way, that's where I do most of my yeah. legal writing. <laughs> just if you were worried. It's a good spot. It's yeah, good right. spots to pick. Um, and the second one picks up right where we leave off. So we literally, you know, the first line is like, I stepped inside, my backpack hit the floor. Oh like it directly, you know, follow, follows the first one and goes up until December of 2019. So it covers two years of my life. So it was a lot harder to write, mostly because I was dredging up so much old emotional stuff yeah. that I've now moved on from. I'm in a very happy healthy relationship now. And a lot of book two is the story of how we got there. Um, and a lot of it's not fun. And I'm not proud of a lot of things um, on my behalf in it. So to go back and continuously relive it was really difficult for me. And I had to do a lot of work to know that I had a responsibility to myself and to my readers to write everything true and authentic as I did the first one, but also know that my partner was going to have to read that. And it's, it was going to suck, you know? Your partner and all of these past individuals that you have been I don't care as with. much about them reading it, but no, well, you know, but, but you get my point. Like, is there <laughs> no, is there any? <laughs> I, I, I totally get that that vibe. Like, but there is is there any sort of outcome there? Like, did did you get feedback from from them about their experience reading your book? Yeah, absolutely. So Javier did read the first book, which, by the way, anyone in the first book, if they if there were text messages included. So like Javier, his mother, his sister, a lot of the people that I met on the trip, um, all of those people had to sign releases. Okay. 
So they all knew they all about knew it was book. coming. They, yep. they gave yeah, me their blessing. I think Javier at the time felt like he kind of owed it to me. That makes that. That makes my lawyer heart sing. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, come on. Lawyer porn. Do you have a contract to read? (laughs) I did all of this by the book. I was covering my ass at every turn. Um, So, yes, he did read the book. Um, It was really difficult for him to read because it's not every day you have to read 280 pages of the way that you broke someone's heart and how they were feeling on their side of the experience the whole time. Mm -hmm. So it was, I know he said it was really difficult for him to read and it took him a while to get through it. There were a lot of times where he was like, oh, good, at least there's, you know, sex and fun stuff coming up. And he was like, nope, sucked just as much. Um, <laughs> but that he also learned a lot from it um, to not always assume what the other person is going through and to be there and support someone, even if you think it's not what they need or want mm-hmm. at the time. Um, and he said it was a really big learning experience for him in how he would, you know, be in relationships in the future. And it's, it, it's an interesting ride to, to see the second book and where it ended up. Um, because I know that I, I get three questions every week of my life. And that's, do you still talk to Javier? Did Chris come to LA and what the fuck happened after Europe? Mm-hmm. Um, so all of those get thoroughly answered um, to satisfaction in book two. I've got another question though, and, and it might be a little off topic. And I know you're in a, in a very happy relationship, which is awesome. But now, like when you get into a relationship, do you kind of give them a disclaimer? Like I might be writing about the shit one day. Uh, um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting because um, my boyfriend came into my life semi quickly after I came home from Europe, um, which is why it was so tumultuous, um, for us to finally get to where we are. Um, and he was the first person to read eat, pray, a in its like raw draft vomit form him and my mother, um, when we were just friends. And so he kind of had this guide to what my life had been and what all my triggers were and the experiences that I had gone through. So I think he kind of knew um, he, he can't. Yeah. But isn't that part of a relationship? Just, I'm sorry to interrupt on this point. Cause I think it's really important. You gave him your playbook. Yeah. Right. A lot of miscommunication is because you don't understand the other person's playbook. 100%. Hmm. And it, and so, that's why our relationship is so strong and that he is the way that he is because he had a map to all my triggers and all of my wounds. And he has from day one protected them fiercely mm-hmm. and never messed with any of them. That's beautiful. That's he, pretty I good. Like Me too. Be. I like this guy. I like <laughs> he, him a lot. He came on and did an episode of FML talk. And um, I had some of my listeners submit questions. And one of them was like, are you scared? You're going to be written about in a book. And he's like, Oh, I already know it's <laughs> happening. And he's like, you know, it's just like, don't fuck up Tay. <laughs> But I always say, you know, if people wanted to be written about fondly, they should have fucking behaved better. Yeah, right. right. Like, not my, it's Amen. not my problem. Amen, sister. It's not, not my, my problem. problem. But I will say that I write in a very, like, even with when I was writing about my ex-husband, there was loads of stuff that I could have put in there that I didn't because it would have just been bashing him and making him look worse. The only things that I wrote about were my experience, the facts, and laying them out for other people to judge. There was never anything that I was like really trying to make him look like a piece of shit. He did that all on his own. Um, And as far as Javier goes, like I wrote that book when I was still very much in love with him. So I took lots of care to make sure that he wasn't the bad guy in the story and that I, I talked about his grief and I showed his struggles. So if people, you know, choose to hate him as a character or dislike him as a character, that's because of their personal experiences that they are triggered by reading about. Um, it's not because I portrayed Mm -hmm. him in that way. Right. I'm exhausted. Everyone needs to read it. I know. And, and, well, and that's so, a, that is exactly when, the point that, the... that this is for in terms of you and me not being in the target audience. I know so many people who need to experience this too. Like I am so eager to start sending links. Get 
No, get yay. this book. Get listen to this episode. Subscribe oh, to the podcast. Well, oh, Pete, I couldn't. I couldn't agree with you more. In in you know, this is what you were saying earlier, Gabrielle. Is that hurt and emotions run throughout humanity? It's not. You know, this only relates to women, and um, I and there's such a strong group of women helping mm-hmm. women, and I appreciate when you're writing this book, you're saying there's other women going through this. I'm going to put this out yep. there for them not even realizing that there are men out there that are really getting some powerful um, life perspective from, from your writing and from your story. Totally. Um, Thank thank you for that. And I, I think that one of the reasons why it's such a quick read and people connect with it so much is because it's really like you're reading a ridiculous Netflix show and you don't (laughs) realize that it's a self-help book. You know, you don't realize that you're going to heal while watching me heal. Yeah. It's really funny you say that about a ridiculous Netflix show because when I read your book, I felt the same way. And so I put my headphones on so my girlfriend could sleep and not listen to hear hear the Netflix going. <laughs> so that's how I actually felt. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, I think uh, I think I interrupted you, Seth. You were about to ask, when is the next book dropping? Yeah. When is it dropping? When, when can people get it? Can they sign up early? Are people camping out? What's happening? So I'm not... R- announcing the release date because then my readers will be banging on my door if God forbid anything happens and it's coming very soon within the next month or so or so we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll give you an order we'll so. give you a little out there uh, as uh, as the attorney on this thank podcast. you thank you for that um, <laughs> including but not limited to <laughs> yes love that love that um, and there's no pre-order it'll just drop on Amazon on the day that it's released I do have signed copies of both of them on my website, which is eatprayfml.com. Um, otherwise, it's exclusively on Amazon in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. Uh, I've actually been recording the audiobook all this week, which is why my voice sounds rather manly today, because oh. <laughs> it's on its way out. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, cannot wait. And I hope once Seth and I have a chance to devour the second book, I hope you'll come back and talk to us about that journey, too. Oh, I would love to. You're, you are a dope individual, Gabrielle Stone. Thanks for hanging out with us. Oh, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. This has been awesome. It's really great. Again, everybody, eatprayfml.com. Uh, and uh, you can find the book where finer books are sold. And uh, FML Talk. Subscribe to that podcast. Yes. Links in yeah, the... Yeah, we have a good time. Links in the show notes. Thanks, everybody. On behalf of Gabrielle Stone and the good Seth Nelson, America's favorite family law attorney, I'm Pete Wright. We'll catch you right here next week on How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. Seth Nelson is an attorney with Nelson Coster Family Law and Mediation with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, How to Split a Toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of Nelson Coster. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.